Radio. Joining me today are two very special guests, Robert Bouval and Thomas Brophy. Robert is the very uh, the originator of the Orion mystery, the, the Orion theory, published in 1994. He introduced the world to a highly original, now internationally famous, star correlation theory about the Giza pyramids in Egypt, and sent a huge shockwave of controversy throughout the scientific community which we still feel the effects of today. Thomas Brophy is a PhD from the University of Colorado, was a staff research scientist at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. Boulder with, uh, I'm sorry, in Boulder, Colorado. And he has a background um, in NASA, work for NASA. He's going to share with us today some of his concepts on the findings at Napta Playa in Egypt. The prehistoric astronomy of Naptoplaya is considered to hold astonishing aspects, enduring enigmas, and recent finds, which they both write in a new book called Black Genesis. We have a lot of information to cover in this next hour, so stay tuned, and I'd like to welcome officially my guests, Robert and Tom. Hello, welcome. Hello, Hello Hillary. <laughs> so I, wanna, I, want, I have questions for both of you, but I'd like your opinions on some of the topics we're going to be sharing today. And uh, so we're going to begin, Robert, with you. And uh, I know that you have a very wonderful explanation of this hard physical evidence of an Egyptian civilization that predates Egypt. So why don't you just begin by telling us uh, what it is that the Black Genesis book that you are, com you know, that's coming out is really all about? Well, Black Genesis, uh, which uh, Tom Brock and I uh, have uh, written over the last year and a half, uh, has a very long background. I'll, I'll be as brief as possible. Uh, it involves the Eastern Sahara, or uh, as we prefer to call it, the Egyptian Sahara, where in the last 30 years uh, have been discovered uh, various sites, one of them particularly, which Tom is more uh, into that, uh, is the Napta Playa site, which is about 100 kilometers west of Abu Simbel, in the extreme south of uh, Egypt. And uh, the other sites, which uh, we'll be talking about in the, in the course of this hour, are in the extreme southwest of Egypt, uh, in a place called Gilf Kibir and Jebel Uwainat. Uh, now, the evidence that has emerged over the last 30 years, and which Tom and I have compiled and interpreted, is that there existed for thousands of years, before the pharaonic civilization, a culture, a prehistoric culture, uh, that uh, had settled in the Sahara, in the Egyptian Sahara, and has left its fingerprints uh, all over the place, but particularly in Napta Playa. And uh, what has emerged from this investigation is that they practiced certain sciences, such as astronomy, and the moving of large blocks, uh, the, the sort of rudimentary architecture, uh, and certain ideologies that, uh, that are evident uh, at Napta Playa, that confirms to us, and now has become rather general with most Egyptologists, and uh, anthropologists, that these people are the precursors of the Egyptian civilization, or perhaps even the, 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 the pre-ancient Egyptians themselves. So this is, in a nutshell, what uh, Black Genesis is all about. And of course, the title tells it all. These prehistoric people were black. They were, they were, we have evidence of this from their rock art that they left in the uh, mountain regions of uh, Gilskibir. Tom, I'd like to ask you um, how you got into all of this, considering your background. Um, what was this like for you to get involved with this expedition? Well, it was fascinating. I, I started studying uh, Napta Playa uh, after a paper on it came out in uh, Nature magazine. Uh, I think it was in 1998 that that first came out. And I had... Uh, started looking into archaeoastronomy of Egypt, in Egypt, uh, uh, one of the first things I did was uh, w when I had some time to do a research project uh, was to uh, test uh, Robert's uh, Ryan correlation theory of the Great Pyramids because uh, uh, my uh, you know, PhD research uh, uh, 
I, I did some related uh, uh, dynamical modeling, uh, 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 computer modeling of uh, the way stars move. Uh, so that's how I got started studying archaeoastronomy, actually. And then, I, then this uh, Naptopia site came up, and, and there was a reason why I was looking in that region anyway. And the data that was in that uh, Nature article was very sketchy, and it was only very partially explained in that article. So there was much left to be explained as to what was really going on at that site. So I just started uh, modeling it and approaching it as a, a puzzle uh, as to uh, what uh, sort of astronomy the people were looking at there. And uh, the studies just sort of went on from there. It turned out there was a lot to, uh, to uh, uh, do still because there were some uh, uh, problems with the initial data. And so... Uh, oh. oh, okay. I'm sorry, go okay. ahead. I'm just, you're breaking up on this end. Okay. And so anyhow, I ended up uh, taking uh, more data, uh, going on site uh, to take, uh, you know, GPS measurements and uh, uh, satellite imagery measurements. And uh, even more recently, I got uh, my colleague uh, uh, who, who, who uh, uh, is, is still at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory to uh, 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 help uh, with studies of ground penetrating radar. So anyhow, we uh, uh, just continued uh, measuring the site and uh, interpreting it, and uh, it all came together in, uh, w along with all this other uh, cultural evidence from the desert region that Robert was talking about that we put together in, in this book, uh, Black Genesis. Robert, why do you think there's such an ongoing fascination with these ancient cultures and the stars? Yeah, before I answer this question, uh, Hillary, uh, let me just add a bit to what Tom said. Uh, the, uh, the, the broker, in a sense, that brought us together is John West. Uh, I'm sure you know John. Uh, he contacted me in uh, the early 2000s, uh, telling me about Tom. And Tom and I eventually met in San Diego. Um, I think it was 2000. And Three or four, Tom, was that? I can't remember. And uh, yeah. this led us to realize that the research that Tom had done, the extensive uh, astronomical research he had done, coupled with the uh, various lines of research that I had done uh, in ancient, uh, on ancient Egypt, would, would perfectly match uh, and bring us together for a, for a full-scale investigation on this lost culture. And uh, finally, what happened is that uh, in 2007, uh, two friends of mine discovered inscriptions in this remote region of the southwest uh, of Egypt, uh, in Jebel in, Wainat. Uh, now, let me just give a picture of the area. Um, from the Nile at Abu Simbel, if you go due west, uh, you will reach Jebel Wainat after 700 kilometers. It's really very, very far away, and even today it's quite an expedition to go uh, with four-wheel drives, uh, let alone in ancient Egyptian times. And uh, Egyptologists were absolutely adamant that the pharaohs, or nobody in fact, had gone to these regions prior to modern times, prior to the invention of the, of the vehicle. Uh, so they were stuck on this, this position until uh, two explorers that I know, Mark Borda, and uh, Mahmoud Marai, an Egyptian, uh, went to this remote place, uh, to Wainat, and lo and behold, they discovered pharaonic inscriptions dating from the Old Kingdom, which proved once and for all that the pharaohs went there. Now, what's very interesting is that the pharaohs seem to have gone to the place where their ancestors had originated, a sort of meet the ancestors type of place. And uh, so I called Tom, and I said, listen, we've got to go there. And uh, one thing led to another, and we actually did mount an expedition in April 2008, and we went there. Perhaps we'll tell you a bit more about it during the, uh, the interview, but it was quite a trip. And it allowed Tom and I to discuss a lot of the um, material that we had piled up uh, through the years during this expedition, because we had long nights and 
plenty of, of time to do that. And uh, that, that is the genesis, if you like, of black genesis. Robert, let Why me ask you another question. question. <laughs> the other yeah, question that, that's okay. <laughs> let me ask you another question before we continue on with my yeah. first question. Um, I'm curious if this culture infiltrated ancient Egypt through the what some call the Nubian queen or the 18th dynasty queens. When they came in, there's some question that maybe there was some Nubian connections. Do you feel that these, this culture may have, in fact, been the, connected in this way? Okay, I'll take this one, Tom. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, let me give you some, some dates here, because the culture we're talking about uh, probably came down into the uh, Egyptian Sahara, which, by the way, was extremely fertile in prehistoric times. That's why they went there. And uh, we think around perhaps 10, 12,000 B.C., and they lingered there uh, and eventually settled in, Pli in the Napta Playa, where there is this uh, famous ceremonial astronomical site, uh, around perhaps six or 7,000 B.C. And when the Sahara began to get super arid and uh, humans could not live there anymore, which was around 4,000 B.C., uh, give or take a few hundred years, it is obvious that these people went to the Nile Valley, which was only 100 kilometers further east. And... They, you know, they, they came in there. God knows what they found. We're not quite sure what was there. They probably were hunter-gatherers and some people living in the, in the valley. And uh, they, they imported not only their cargo of knowledge, but they imported their genetic origin, which was black, black Africans. And uh, I have no doubt in my mind that, that the Nubians that uh, eventually are recorded in history like you mentioned, in the, certainly the 18th dynasty and so forth. And today, as a matter of fact, there's a lot of uh, black Nubians that live in the area are descendants from this prehistoric culture. So uh, that's the broad picture. Uh, what happened afterwards is another matter. There, there was a lot of import in Egypt, but we're talking about much later times, where Mediterranean people and people from the Levant and various other regions, and, uh, and the whole racial origins got mixed, like it happened around the globe, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, I'd like to say this, and then I'll hand over to Tom. It is a matter of fact, not a matter of theory, that we all are, have our origins in Central Africa, in East Africa, to be more precise. Uh, we, have, we started all there, and we are all from that racial origin. We are, if you like, uh, black turned white, <laughs> if one has to put it this way. We all have that origin. This is now a fact. I mean, it's, it's well documented in the genetic studies and uh, cultural studies and anthropological studies. So, yes, to answer your question, yes, Nubians are from that source, from that batch. Tom, I have a question for you. You you have something in your work called an origin map that talks about the calibration of the zodiac in the yuga cycle. Would you care to comment on how this work relates to what we're discussing? Well, sure. Um, uh, that book, uh, The Origin Map, contains some of my early studies of the Napta Playa astronomy and also, uh, as I mentioned, the... the uh, uh, reworking, uh, retesting of, of the uh, Giza Plateau uh, astronomy. And I uh, found uh, what I, I thought, I think, is suggestions of a tracking of the Yuga, what's known as the Yuga cycle, which is the, uh, the uh, uh, ancient Indian name for the, the uh, precession cycle and also uh, associated with the cycle of uh, cultural development uh, that goes through the uh, high time, the Satya Yuga, and the low time, the Kali Yuga, high or low, depending on how you define it, material-oriented or spiritual-oriented times. And uh, that's what, that's what, uh, that's a connection that's made in that book Actually, I mentioned it uh, in my first book uh, called uh, "The Mechanism, Demands, and Mysticism," where I explore the uh, I explored the uh, 
sort of openness of modern physical science paradigms to uh, a reconnection with the spiritual aspects of, of uh, the universe. And these uh, uh, cycles, uh, that, that there are hints of ancient peoples tracking them, uh, in their 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 uh, monumental uh, astronomy is is uh, what I describe in, in the origin map. Mm. Robert, would you care to comment also on why these astrological alignments were so important to precultures? Yes, uh, as you mentioned in, in the introduction, I'm, uh, my my uh, my my thing is. Uh, ancient astronomy and ancient Egypt. Uh, I developed uh, the theory of the Orion correlation theory, which shows uh, that the pyramids of Giza are in correlation. Uh, the, the pattern is in correlation to the three stars of Orion's belt. Now, uh, there is a lot of circumstantial evidence uh, and astronomical evidence and textual evidence that uh, supports very strongly this correlation. But you have to look at it from the context of the time. Now, and also the geographical conditions. I think uh, both of these uh, points have to be very carefully considered. Now, coming to, uh, regarding the Giza pyramids and the uh, attempt to, to somehow link that zone of the sky, the Orion zone of the sky, to the uh, pyramid zone, uh, stems from uh, the uh, fact that Egypt is very much a cyclical kind of geographical location. Now, we all know of the seasons, of course, and each uh, one of us, depending where we live in the world, uh, uh, knows the, the, the variation of the seasons and the cycles that that, uh, that we undergo through the, year, through the year. But in Egypt, there was something else that made these, this annual cycle much, much more uh, pronounced, much more uh, dramatic. And that was the annual flooding of the Nile. This, this, the Nile would, and still does, by the way, uh, floods <coughs> around the end of June. The, 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 the water starts rising. And in ancient times, before they built the dams, today, today there are dams in, in, uh, in uh, Upper Egypt that block the flood. But before the, the dams, the, the water would, would uh, reach all the way to the Mediterranean, the flood waters. And it would naturally irrigate the land as it uh, broke through the banks and, uh, and watered the, uh, the adjacent land. And this created a natural hydraulic system that Egypt uh, was literally fertilized by this mystical flood and uh, and the crops would would grow and and so forth so in a sense the flood was 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 the the flood was the the um, the, uh, the the vascular vein the the the, the, the life blood of egypt without without the flood uh, egypt would not probably have existed the way the way it had so the focus was on this flood and how to explain the flood because they didn't know the origins of the Nile. They, were, they didn't know where the water came from, uh, let alone why it came in the, in, in the height of summer, which you would expect the water to, of the Nile to, to, to ebb rather than rise. So this whole focus on the Nile made them look at the sky. They tried to look for an explanation of the sky because the sky obviously has the same cycles. It, it, uh, the stars move in a, in a yearly pattern, uh, the sun, of course, uh, changes position throughout the year and so forth. And they noticed that prior to the flood, there would be a kind of cosmic herald, if you like, a cosmic signal. And that was the apparition of the constellation of Orion, and followed by the, the bright star Sirius. And around that, a whole religious mythology developed. Now, we thought that this was original to the pharaohs. And I think Tom will elaborate on this. Uh, the surprise has come when naphtaply was discovered in the uh, 1970s and later when it was studied from an astronomical point of view in the, in the late 1990s. The surprise came when the astronomy of naphtaply, which is thousands of years before the pyramids, 
contain the very same astronomical alignments. The, the, the site has alignments to Orion's belt, to Sirius, and uh, suddenly we became uh, extremely aware that it wasn't the Egyptians or it wasn't the pharaohs that we thought uh, had originated all this. It came from these prehistoric people. I'm going to let Tom elaborate on this uh, Napta play astronomy because he's much more uh, into that. I mean, I've studied it as well, but I think he can tell you more. But it, yeah. it is that specific point that raised the alarm. There is something before the pharaohs, and that something is at Napta Playa. Go ahead, Tom. Sure. Tom, before you, I'm sorry, before you elaborate, I'd like you to also comment on why these pyramid, pyramids are found globally all over the world in ancient cultures. It doesn't just exist within Egypt. It's all over the planet. And I'd like you to comment, if you will, on not only the astrology of this particular site and within Egypt, but how it relates to a global sense of understanding. Well, um, well for one thing, uh, Robert Schock did a, a book about the globe, about pyramids around the globe, which, which is interesting. Um, and there's there is clearly uh, uh, we find ancient uh, pyramids uh, around the globe, so uh, we can uh, you know take two uh, tracks of ex explaining explaining that uh, perhaps they were developed these type of uh, uh, monumental architecture was developed independently uh, because it reflects something in nature that is sort of independently discoverable, like all sciences, or perhaps there was uh, 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 relations, uh, uh, travel, uh, a, a global culture of some sort, either, e either one of those two. Do you feel that there was some kind of catastrophe? I know we're, we're kind of moving off the what your, my original question was, but do you feel that there was some kind of global, you know, the biblical flood or some kind of global catastrophe that caused, you know, some kind of, um, I don't know, a culture that was highly advanced to be, you know, left with the basics and trying to rebuild from that as best they could? Because sometimes it feels to me that, and Robert, you can elaborate and answer on this too if you like, that these cultures were coming back from something where they gave, they already had this very advanced knowledge. And Robert, in your books, you touch on the, the concept of Atlantis and this global-like place of, you know, higher understandings and already advanced technology and, and understandings. Uh, Tom, do you feel that this was the case, that there was some kind of global shift or change or catastrophe, lots of theories on it, I know, that caused this to happen, and they were kind of rebuilding their coordinates, so to speak, with the sky? Well, in Black Genesis, actually, we, we do uh, a touch on that. It, we, we sort of, it, we, in, the, in Black Genesis, we sort of uh, ha, uh, have a dual approach. We, we uh, make firm this connection of around, uh, in time-wise, uh, uh, the, the pre-dynastic period, 3500 BC and earlier uh, to the to the uh, uh, North African uh, uh, Saharan desert, which was then not desert but was uh, uh, temperate climate, uh, including Napta Playa. And then we also uh, 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 review and uh, make some new uh, make some new uh, points about the uh, what what Robert has has uh, uh, called in, in his. Uh, Previous books, the first time in in uh, Egypt, in ancient Egypt, which was uh, much earlier, around uh, uh, 11,000 BC, and now we know uh, from uh, climatology that there there was uh, 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 around that time uh, major uh, uh, global climate change and uh, major uh, uh, sea level rise of I forget uh, uh, many tens of meters or, or more. So. Uh, we do know there was a, a you know physical climate change, and this uh, 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 Yuga cycle it turns out uh, also had uh, independently uh, a sort of uh, uh, 
inflection point or, or uh, moving through the high time at, at that same time. So we kind of we, in this in this new book we kind of uh, uh, start making uh, uh, more all the connections through time, you know, going back further in time towards that first time. Robert, you care yeah. to comment? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, I, what I'd like to say, and I always say this when I'm asked a question like this, is that uh, there is no reason at all why a high culture did not pre-exist our uh, historical view of, of human civilization. Uh, I remember a, a phrase that uh, a very prominent uh, astronomer once told me, uh, Professor Archie Roy in, in Glasgow University. He said there were Einsteins and Newtons and geniuses, you know, 10,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago. There's no reason at all why geniuses such as these uh, great scientists that we know in our, in our times uh, did not exist in those days. The only difference, I think, that uh, seems to be the case is that they had, they perhaps didn't have the, the science and the technology we have, and therefore they developed in a very different way. They, they, they searched inwardly rather than outwardly. And uh, they might have developed an extremely high uh, knowledge, a sort of gnosis, I would say, a kind of great wisdom uh, of which we have lost. And to me, it's always been the case where I feel that there is a lost wisdom, a lost, a lost knowledge that clearly, even when we look at historically Egypt, uh, such as the pyramids, for example, uh, you know, screams at you. You know, uh, not just the, the the mystery of the place, but the the technology that they use. So, uh, you know, it's, I wouldn't put it out of the question that there was some high culture floating about, which we haven't detected. And here we are, uh, at least finding its first fingerprints, if it existed. I mean, Napta Playa, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, I think we both feel the same, uh, is the fingerprints of a culture that was long regarded as, as primitive and, and, uh, and with the evidence that we're, we're unmasking, they were a long way from being primitive. In fact, they, they seem to have been far more sophisticated than, uh, than uh, the early Egyptians. You know, they, they practiced uh, very sophisticated astronomy. They seem to have tracked one of the most difficult things to do in astronomy, which is tracking the precession of the equinox, the moving of stars over a long period of time, and in a very, very difficult uh, geographical condition. I mean, if you go to Napta Playa, you will realize that it's not the easiest place to do this sort of stuff, moving stones. and So uh, I think that what Tom and I have found in a very physical way is literally the the fingerprints, the, the the footprints, the left, the legacy of that sophisticated culture that that we see uh, in Napta Playa. Yeah, if I I'd like to sort of fill in two points uh, around that, if I could. Yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, you, you were mentioning before uh, the uh, Old Kingdom. Uh, uh, use of the reappearance of Sirius every year, the, the, the bright star Sirius, to herald the, the flooding of the Nile, very important in ancient Egypt. And the uh, 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 early Old Kingdom temples were uh, aligned towards Sirius and even changed their alignment as they were rebuilt as Sirius's uh, uh, position changed through precession. And now we find that the megalithic, the, the large stone alignments, also tracking Sirius, uh, the star Sirius, in the same sort of way, and just predating, just earlier than the earliest Old Kingdom temples along the Nile were, and also uh, uh, simultaneously tracking at Nebta the, the rising of Sirius with the rising, with a uh, 
uh, North Circumpolar Star, or one of the, the uh, uh, stars that we, we call the, the Big Dipper, or the ancient Egyptians called the, uh, the, the Thigh Constellation. And uh, that we find uh, repeated at Naphtapaya just centuries uh, before and leading up to the time when Naphtapaya suddenly became hyper-arid, extreme desert like it is now, and uh, the people clearly, uh, the, the culture clearly, and probably actually the, the people moved from there to to the Nile and and uh, began the, the Egyptian civilization. Then if we take uh, uh, even further back in time at what we find at Naphtapaya, there's something very interesting and, and something still still mysterious there uh, uh, called bedrock sculptures. They're sculpted stones that are on the, the bedrock that's underneath uh, meters, uh, say three meters, ten feet or so, of playa sediments, sediments that came into the playa uh, as the playa filled up seasonally with, with water uh, when it was, when it was uh, raining before it was extreme desert. And that uh, sedimentation period was from the end of the last ice age up until about 3,500 BC when it became extreme desert. And the fact that uh, there are there are found at Nabtapaya underneath those sediments, sculpted onto the bedrock, uh, these these mysterious sculptures that are associated with the uh, the uh, the star-aligned uh, large stones, megaliths, that are on top of the playa sediments, uh, is still mysterious as to what those uh, bedrock sculptures are and who, who created them and how ancient they really are. Because, you know, the, the first sort of approximation is that would be that uh, they were sculpted uh, before the sediments that were laid down on top of them. But that is, uh, uh, you know, sort of outside the uh, uh, normally accepted range of uh, when when ancient people were doing that sort of thing. Uh, but even so, uh, well, so a, a little story around that is that, so the the uh, the uh, archaeologists who were excavating the site uh, when they found this these bedrock uh, sculptures associated with the uh, surface uh, on top of the sediment megaliths. They uh, they were very puzzled by that and and uh, came up with various uh, hypotheses saying that somehow the Neolithic people around 5000 BC when the sedimentation stopped happening uh, figured out where those bedrock lumps were and they dug down through the sediments and sculpted those those uh, lumps of bedrock and then filled the sediments back in and then put the uh, uh, arrangement of of megaliths on top of the sediments. Uh, it was sort of convoluted reasoning to 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 uh, keep it within the uh, accepted uh, uh, range of of when Neolithic people were doing that sort of thing. Uh, more recently, uh, they even they even those scholars have accepted that it's likely that that was not what happened. But those uh, bedrock sculptures are more ancient. And uh, they, they, their, their association with the surface sculptures was maintained through time over the, 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 the millennium. And so this is a, a remaining uh, mystery that we're just starting to uh, make the connections to at Naphtapaya that, that uh, uh, brings, brings or takes the, uh, the, this mysterious culture that was the precursor to uh, ancient Egyptian civilization even further back in time. I want to ask a question, and I'd like both of you to comment briefly on this. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit to our previous discussion of the 18th Dynasty queens and their Nubian connection. And I know that it's common knowledge that knowledge was passed down from mother to daughter. It was more of a matriarchal system. And I'd like to know both of your personal insights or opinions on why you think we switched from a matriarchal society to more of a patriarchal society. Robert, let's start with you. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it is true that uh, certainly the ancient Egyptians, uh, the historical period throughout the ancient Egypt, 
uh, placed women, and particularly women divinities, in a very prominent position. Uh, we have many, many uh, ancient Egyptian goddesses, or rather I would like to see them as principle of the divine feminine. Uh, I think that's a better way of looking at them. But we have goddesses, of course, like Isis, with, who became a universal goddess. Uh, the cult of Isis was not just a practice in Egypt for 3,000 years, but eventually it was exported in the Roman Empire uh, and uh, stretched all the way to Europe. We find temples of Isis all the way to, to, to England. Uh, the cult of Hathor, uh, the cult of the, of the sky goddess Snut, and, and a variety of others. Uh, one of the great goddesses of, of uh, Egypt was also the goddess Seshet, who uh, was responsible for the, uh, indeed, for the alignment, astronomical alignment of monuments. Uh, and the uh, keeping the annals of, of royalty and so forth. So there is no question at all that the ancient Egyptians placed women and uh, women divinity or the, or the concept of women divinity at a very, very high position. Now, why did it change? Uh, I think we have to look elsewhere. Um, the, uh, the change stems from the, um, more on the, from the biblical events. You know, there's no question that um, that the, uh, that the the, the 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 Old Testament presents us with a patriarchal um, society, led by by men that make law and uh, and 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 and, and uh, decide uh, and communicate indeed with with the with the divinity. So I think that's where the change occurred, and uh, perhaps I should say that. One of the reasons Egypt is very attractive uh, to women, in particular, uh, I, I conduct tours in Egypt, as I know, as you know, Hillary, and uh, many, many women uh, do come uh, mainly because they feel that somehow they are connecting again with a aspect of human civilization that has been lost, and they feel very comfortable there. I mean, they they, they suddenly feel in a very feminine environment. Uh, they, they, they see uh, themselves reconnecting to a, like you could say, a matriarchal um, society uh, where women were uh, were very dominant, were very free. Uh, well, what I was saying is that, uh, you know, uh, more than 3,000 years ago, uh, Egypt was ruled uh, by a woman pharaoh, Hatshepsut. And uh, 2,000 years ago, a little bit more than that, was uh, Cleopatra. Uh, you know, this has not occurred in, in Western Europe uh, till much, much later. And indeed, in, in some Western countries, we still do not have uh, women rulers. Now, so, Robert, I have, to, I have to cut you off here for a second, because Hatshepsut is a very um, personal interest of mine. And I'm curious if you feel that she, her story has been misunderstood. Do you feel that she was perhaps trying to bring back that connection that was perhaps lost before her? You know, uh, bringing back the connection, I'm not quite sure. I think the, 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 um, the high position of women was, was very, very well established in Egypt. I think what was unknown, or at least as far as we know from historical records, was that a queen could rule alone without a pharaoh. Uh, she established that precedent. But they seem to have accepted it very, very well. So it seems that there was no resistance to this. Uh, there seems to have been some resistance from her, from her uh, successor. Uh, eventually to Moses the third, but um, the uh, the idea was quite well absorbed in Egypt. I mean, the, the, one can see this from the the amazing legacy that she uh, she left, the the, the great temple of uh, Deir el Bahari, uh, and various others. She contributed, for example, to the uh, to the construction of the uh, temple of Karnak, which only pharaohs had done so far. 
So, yeah, I like uh, I like your, your your you were talking before um, we lost you and had to reestablish the connection about women present day women who go back to Egypt and experience this connection, and I'd like to comment on that and uh, talk a little bit about how the queen or the priestess would feed the pharaoh uh, blue lotus and you know lotus flowers were a very strong symbol and they're seen throughout the entire area of Egypt and in all the different temples and it was a very important symbol and uh, there, I, I believe women when they go back to Egypt they feel a sense of coming home to themselves and they also can connect to the divine feminine but they also they also realize a, a connection to the divine male which I think the balance of the two was very important in these cultures and I'm curious, uh, Tom. You have a you have a um, a wonderful concept that you call psycho spiritual growth, and I'm curious if you feel this personally while you walk through these old places. Um, both of you can comment on that, and and what your thoughts are about that. Um, well, sure. Uh, make a quick comment. Uh, um, I I. Uh, like and use in my teaching sometimes the, the uh, work of uh, Ken Wilber on uh, integral developmental philosophy, integral, integral developmental theory, which suggests that <clears throat> these uh, various stages and states of being both individually and culturally have always existed, including the um, uh, stages that we might call higher stages that uh, uh, equally honored and equally uh, <clears throat> balanced and uh, honored the divine feminine and divine masculine have always existed. And it's, and it's, it's sort of uh, people, or individuals, and uh, uh, subgroups have always tapped into those uh, uh, structures, uh, stages, and it's the dominant uh, external culture, political events, that have uh, sort of descended or, uh, as you suggested, uh, moved into a lopsided uh, 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 vein in recent uh, centuries and, and, and millennia. So, uh, yeah, and then that, and when we visit the when 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 I visit these temples, uh, and uh, I I think we can definitely uh, uh, feel a connection. Robert, would you care to comment? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to take this on a on a on a slightly different um, direction. Uh, I firmly believe that uh, that uh, men and women are endowed with uh, with archetypes, and that uh, each woman uh, has uh, within her uh, a variety of archetypes. One of them being and I believe the strongest, the most, the most sublime, is the goddess. This, this notion of being specially connected with the divine, uh, having healing powers, having the ability to heal and to and to teach. Uh, the Egyptians recognized this uh, very early, uh, and you always, always see uh, divinities. Uh, in the role of nurturing and teaching and healing. So when you go to Egypt, uh, uh, unfortunately I'm not a woman, so I can't experience that uh, strongly, but certainly I see it in women who come there, that they immediately feel at home. They, they, they're in, a, in an environment. I'm talking about ancient Egypt, of course. You know, when they enter temples, uh, they sense that they are in an environment that was very much in the way that they like to see themselves, that they feel they are in that way, and that they don't feel that in the Western world. It's very obvious. And uh, they, they develop a, a great connection, a great uh, desire to be in, in those kind of environments. And some, some women uh, just love uh, staying in temples and, and, and experiencing that, uh, that mood of the, of the feminine. So ancient Egypt is very, very geared for that. It's, it's perhaps one of the only cultures I know that uh, has focused intensely on, on, the, on the feminine um, powers 
the godly, the, the goddess powers. You know, and uh, to me, uh, there are certain temples, for example, that that uh, that express this very powerfully. Uh, the temple Don't you of feel that, that when they walk into a temple, they feel their connection back to the earth? You know, we, we're looking up all the time, looking at the connections to the stars, but what women really feel when they go into these temples is a connection back to the earth. Don't you agree? Well, where women uh, are the carriers and the creators of life. I mean, they, 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 they give birth. Uh, and therefore, their connection to, to nature and to, to, and to the earth is extremely powerful. I think it's it's something that is very, very much within their uh, their whole being, their, their psychic and their nature, and uh, is totally connected to this. So it's not surprising that um, if placed in an environment such as Egypt, where this connection was extolled, was was venerated, was exposed, rather than uh, detached, then women immediately feel uh, feel uh, relinked, feel feel uh, plugged in again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's that's how I see uh, ancient Egypt. It, although the civilization is no more there, the um, the sockets are there, if you like, and, and women can plug themselves again uh, and and feel what what truly they should feel this 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 powerful connection with the earth. Yes, you're absolutely right. Now, these cultures, these cultures that you've been exploring, um, do, are shamanistic. Origins, yes? You're asking me or Tom? Oh, either one of you, if you'd like to comment. Tom, we can start with you. Well, sh sure, I think we could say that. Actually, um, in, in uh, the book Black Genesis, we uh, mention uh, well, and, and we describe visiting in the uh, uh, deep desert, uh, Gebel Awanat uh, and uh, Kibir regions, the uh, ancient cave art, rock art sites, and uh, uh, some of them uh, uh, clearly have uh, what uh, 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 appear like uh, shamanic imagery. Uh, in, in fact, one of them, I started calling the Cave of the Shamans because it had such uh, uh, clear imagery, uh, sh shamanic ritual-like imagery, uh, you know, a, a shaman human figure emerging out of the, the head, head of a, a, a wild animal and this sort of thing. Robert? Yeah, I, I, I like. Yes, I'm glad you brought this up, Tom, because I think we should we should also say that uh, when we did go there, and let me explain. I mean, it's it's uh, it sounds sort of very easy, but in fact, uh, when Tom and I connected in Egypt and we had a small expedition team, it took us five days with with four wheel drives to actually reach those remote areas, and by the time you get there. Um, You've lost everything to do with modern civilization. I mean, there's absolutely nothing in the environment uh, at all that reminds you or uh, or brings any notion of modern civilization. You, you're there with nature in its very primordial form uh, in in these these areas of the Sahara. You know, you feel like you're at the earth when the earth was born. It's a very strange feeling. And uh, I think that even though we didn't stay that long, uh, we began to very much connect uh, instinctively with with nature, uh, which is the first step of shamanism, in my in my view. You know, we began to feel linked, with, and I use the word plugged in. Maybe that's perhaps a better term. You know, we we at night, for example, we. Uh, we sensed very much the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the cosmic environment, the stars, the, the, the whole mood of the place engulfed us. And uh, I remember that night, I don't know if you remember that as much as I do, Tom, when we were at uh, the Gilfi Kibir, and we, uh, we went in, a, in one of those caves where there was a lot of rock art, the famous cave of swimmers. Yeah. And and we stayed there for for a while uh, at night, in in the darkness of the night, and watching the stars. And there was this amazing sense of feeling something that we didn't feel before. I never felt it before. Is the 
sense of cosmic connection and 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 that if one could understand this one could uh, somehow uh, achieve high levels of 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 the self um, so to me it's not surprising at all of what you said earlier tom that the people that lived in those areas for for throughout their lives uh, were in fact uh, very much in a shamanic mood uh, I think I think also ancient Egypt, by the way. But I, certainly there, one, one sees it in their drawings. One sees it in the in the whole atmosphere of the place. Yeah, when 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 you and uh, Hillary were talking a few minutes ago about the, the feeling of uh, connection with earth and sky in the temples, in, in the Nile temples, I was thinking uh, of that as uh, recreating uh, what we experienced in the deep desert, uh, sort of naturally uh, that, that you're confronted with, uh, perhaps those uh, Nile temples sort of recreate the, that uh, connection with earth and sky, both that uh, one is confronted with out in the deep desert. I have, a Absolutely. Vision of, I have a vision of people, women, men, both coming to the temples, reconnecting with the earth, and then perhaps reconnecting to the cosmos because of that connection. We are out of time, and I would like to Thank both my guests for joining me, and Robert, for people who are interested in your tours and also more information about your new book, your, uh, what's the best way to get in touch with you, your website? Why yes, don't you the let, best, the best way is my website. Yeah, let me give the website. It's uh, www.robertboval.co.uk. And I usually say do not go to .com because you'll find a hijacked site which shows pornographic material. So that's not me. Mine is .co.uk. And, yes, uh, Black Genesis is coming out, by the way, in April. Uh, Tom and I feel we've done a great job uh, putting it together. And uh, it will appear first in the, in the United States, by the way.